I want us to look at a Japanese scientist called Dr. Emoto. He decided to study water and the impact of the words spoken by humans on water. So he gathered several jars of water from one source and he had a group of people speak good words to each jar and he flash froze the water and examined the crystals under the microscope from the water and they were beautiful. Words like thank you created the most beautiful crystals. Compassion, wisdom, truth, all these life-giving words create good things in the water crystal. But when the person spoke words that were negative, such as you make me sick, the crystals had no shape. They were displeasing to look upon. Look at the word evil if you can see where my cursor is. The word you fool, horrible effects on the water. Now I want us to pay attention to the fact that our bodies are more than 75% water. So if we speak words, even about another person which are negative, we are impacting the very water in our body. The water is what carries information to nourish your cells, which is what the whole, your whole health is dependent on. You know, there are many persons that we pray for good people, people who speak words. I remember praying for a lady once with cancer and, you know, I said, you know, you're going to need to forgive your ex-husband. And she said, I can't, he's evil. If you knew the things that he did, and do you know that we, she refused to forgive him and kept speaking those words until the very day she died. Now, I wonder if she had changed her words, it would have changed the very chemistry that it was operating in her body. So the more science goes deep into these things is the more they prove the word of God. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to take it a little bit further. There is someone who did an experiment which is similar with rice from his pot. He took two samples of rice, two samples of the same rice from the same pot, put them in jars. He wrote on one jar, I love you. And on the other, he wrote, I hate you. And for 13 days, he spoke to the rice. And this is what happened to the rice that was spoken, that was told that it was hated. It developed black mold. The rice that was spoken love to, that rice developed into a kind of rice wine. So when we speak hateful words, either about ourselves or even think them, and, and speak or think um, these words about another, the words have to pass through our, ourselves first. It, it comes through us first to go to another, and it it. It steals the life. It damages the soul of the person and damages the body of the speaker. So we have to be very mindful what we speak. Of course, we've heard about singing to plants and so on. An experiment done by school children using red peas. I'm sure we've all done this in some shape or form. I know I have in, in school days, younger school days, where we just put the, C, the P in and then we observe it grow. We give it conditions that would support its growth and then we, we allow it to grow. Now, words that we're told, were told by school children, we love you, thank you. That seedling that grew up grew twice as tall and twice as lush as the others. The, the plant that grew, the seedling that grew in the middle was called a stupid idiot. And it barely, it, it barely came out of the sea before it curved back in, almost in shame. And the one on the far right that was told nothing grew normally, but not as well as the one that was told the loving words. Now this has deep implications. How many of us as we grew were told words of love? If you have been, then wonderful. But for those of us who haven't, you know, we need to make up for lost time and, and really expose ourselves to nurturing loving words. The word of God says, love our neighbors as ourselves. 
But if you're going to love your neighbor, then you have to love yourself first. If you're going to love your neighbor as yourself, you have to start with yourself, right? And a lot of us forget how to do that because we're told that if you love yourself, it's selfish. So we develop a habit of loving and nurturing others more than ourselves. We're going to see the dangers of that soon. We're going to see that soon. We also have to be mindful of what we speak to children and speak to other people. Now, I want to share an experience I had at a church that I attended in the past. There was a young man. I will call him Jack for the purpose of this conversation. Um, he, I was called in church to come and see Jack because he seemed to be experiencing the signs of a heart attack. And so I ran out to where he was. And as he sat on a chair waiting for an ambulance to arrive, he had his, his hands clutching his chest and he was gasping for breath, obviously in pain, gray, gray as a sheet, looking like he, he could die. And so I, I have to give God thanks for the Holy Spirit because I got it clear that he had spoken a word over himself and even what the words were that he thought he'd be better off dead. And so I, I asked him, I said, Jack, did you speak the words that you figured it would be better off if you were dead? And he nodded barely, you know, he, he nodded. And so I said, Jack, you're gonna have to cancel those words. I know you can hardly speak, but I'm gonna ask you to even move your lips and agree with me. And I led him in a prayer to cancel those words and to receive and speak the new words that he will live and proclaim the works of the Lord, to repent of those words that he had spoken against his own life. And as he did that, I saw his breath begin to slow. I saw the grip that he had over his chest begin to loosen. I saw that color began to return. And Jack got up from that chair and was able to retake his position and the job that he was doing for the church fully healed with no need for an ambulance Hallelujah. and that was the most rapid manifestation of repentance it's a it's an experience that makes it so clear what can happen when we cancel and break word curses off of our lives now i want to show you another experience i had where a person used their words to bring about healing from an incurable disease. Okay. The name of the disease was stiff person syndrome. Now I'd never heard of that disease in all medical school, in, in all my life until the point when a friend of mine first manifested with this. And, and when you did the research, you realize that only about a hundred, a handful of people in the world had this disease. It's a disease whose, whose um, the, the future, the, the, the expectation from the disease was not good. It's a disease which caused your body, every muscle to stiffen until you were twisted and contorted and frozen in a, in a gargoyle type of, of um, body habitus. And at a certain point, your muscles would be so stiff that your lung muscles will stop the very ability to breathe. And if shortly thereafter, the person with this disease would die. It had a two year life expectancy after diagnosis. And I, I saw my friend who incidentally is a male, but I wanted to show you um, how severe this disease is. So I, I used this picture of a person who had it that I could find. But this um, male friend of mine, I heard him say to his wife that, you know, the medication doesn't make me feel good and it's bringing other side effects. So I am going to trust God and God is going to heal me. And I thought, wow, you know, this is nice. He has such faith. And as I watched him, the disease progress like a beast. It, it, it began to twist his body to the extent that his movement became limited. And he continued to declare, I know the Lord is healing me. 
I watched as he fell and hit his head and had to get stitches. I watched as he fell and spent five hours on the floor one day because no one was there to recognize that he had fallen and couldn't get up. I watched as this young man got worse and worse and had to be led like a pet on a leash by his wife because he couldn't walk without holding on. I mean, it, it was hospital visit after hospital visit. His wife was upset and said, why don't you just take the medicine? You're putting more burden on me. And he said, no, I know the Lord is gonna heal me. And he kept saying that. And then one day a thought came to me, I could go and do this particular treatment. It's, it's unusual, but I can go and help him with it. And somebody else was led by God to go and carry some coconut oil to give him. And as he saw it, he couldn't get it out of his mind. He began to add that coconut oil to his smoothies. Then he began to, to loosen up a little bit and was able to walk holding onto the wall. And then as he walked outside, you know, he was led to go outside a lot. And when he went outside, he saw a little plant growing in the pavement. And he said, you know, I can't get my mind off this. It seems as if the Lord is highlighting this plant to me. And so he plucked it up and started making tea with it. Turns out that plant was guinea hen weed. So he, he was led by God and people were led to him. The more he declared, I know God is healing me. Even when things look bleak, even when things look bad, he kept proclaiming, I know that God is healing me. He began to untwist uncurl and unfurl he began to be able to take a few steps without holding on he began to walk be able to walk up and down the road he began to be able to dance oh, and drive yeah. and go back to work Hallelujah. again and now glory to god he and his wife are working on having a baby he has no very little evidence of, of this disease. The, the disease progression has halted and he just may be the only person in this world who has been able to halt this most heinous disease through the power of his words and through his faith in God. So I want to encourage us. There is no disease that God has never heard of. There is nothing the enemy can bring that God does not know how to defeat. We just need to lay hold on trust and use our words. We need to trust him and use our words. Now I'm going to share a personal testimony. I came to this one by accident. I was at a staff luncheon and I was excited about eating the food. I'm always excited about eating food. So I was excited that day. And, you know, the team was there. We were all dressed up and we were looking forward to, you know, just having that fellowship together over this meal at a nice, fancy restaurant. When another doctor came and sat the, the metal prong, the metal leg of her chair into the top of my right foot, I saw every kind of star. The skin on the top, the flesh on the top of my foot was torn away. I don't know if you can see, it was stripped off. And I thought, I, I, I was in so much pain that at first I couldn't speak. It was unspeakable. People were fussing around and saying, oh my goodness, we have to go to Andrew's hospital. We have to get this done. And we have to get an x-ray and a tetanus shot. And, you know, it was an excitement, but I couldn't speak at first. But I found that... I made a decision at that time that I was not going to Andrews. We were not going to interrupt our nice lunch. We were not going to miss that. So I began to speak. And what I heard coming out of my mouth was, this is not going to be a problem. And at first, it was, it was just a whisper because I couldn't speak. And then as, as I spoke it more and more with more and more strength, I noticed the pain began to sharply fall off. The skin that has stripped off, leaving that pink um, lower dermal tissue, I just patted it back down, very undoctorly. But I just patted it back down because I had no intention of spending the next several hours in a hospital. And so I kept saying with more and more strength, this is not going to be a problem. Eventually, the people around me got it and said, well, I guess so, if you say so, but whew, that looks serious to me, but if you say so. So 
I quickly, the pain fell off sharply and we were able to have a nice lunch. Later that evening, I went home and was talking to my husband and I said, oh, I have something to tell you. Do you know that I was really injured today? I'm going to show you this because by now it's probably infected or really in need of attention. I probably am going to need a shot. But look at my foot because this is what happened to me. Look, let's, let's, we're going to need to dress it together. And I showed him, I held out my foot. I stretched it out to show him the injury and the damage. And there was no trace of it. Not a trace, yeah. not a trace. There was no sign yeah. that the skin had been torn away. Everything had healed and sealed supernaturally. I felt like a fool because there I was before my husband ready to show him what had happened. I'm just glad he knows that I tell the truth and he trusts me because otherwise I would have, I, I, there would have been no proof. We pressed the, the area and there was no pain. No pain could be elicited in what was on, in an area where there was unspeakable pain only hours before. There was no sign of even a line or a cut or a bruise, nothing. Because I declared over and over that this was not going to be a problem. And then my eyes were opened after that moment. And I began to teach my children that every hurt plays, everything that seems to come, everything the enemy wants, it seems the enemy is just mainly after attention. And once we understand that, every panic attack we can speak to, every anxiety we can speak to, night terrors, we can say, no, 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 this is not going to get my attention. This is not going to be a problem. If we learn to speak, we can use our words and defeat the enemy and bring him to open shame. We can enforce the open shame that the finished work of Christ has, has um, created for us. So we shall speak to our mountains. We can tell them to go and throw themselves into the sea. And once we don't doubt, I didn't even have a whole lot of faith. I didn't even know what was going to happen. But we spoke. I spoke into a situation. And it was as I had spoken. The Lord did it for me as I had spoken. So let us move in that. 